Welcome to FEM TV. Thanks for tuning in. In this episode, we feature Rachel Hecker, one of Houston's most promising artists. Rachel Hecker was born in Providence, Rhode Island in 1958. She attended Moore College of Art in Philadelphia, where she earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in Sculpture in 1980. In 1982, she earned a Master of Arts degree in Painting from the Rhode Island School of Design. After graduation, she accepted a teaching position at the Museum of Fine Arts Glassell School of Art. She remained at the Glassell for almost nine years, rising to the position of acting director. Hecker's artwork has been displayed in Houston area exhibitions every year since 1983, including two solo exhibitions at the Texas Gallery in 1988 and 1992, and 23 different group shows in locations such as the Museum of Fine Arts, the Contemporary Arts Museum, and the Blaffer Gallery. In 1989, she was awarded the National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship in painting. Commissions of Hecker's work can be seen at several area buildings. These commissions include four paintings at La Mora Restaurant on Lovett Boulevard, one of the original murals at 80 Restaurant on Greenbrier, a mural at the University of Houston Computer Center, and the painting titled Censorship at the entrance to Diverse Works. Since 1984, Hecker's artwork has been mentioned in 17 different publications, including nine times in the Houston Chronicle, seven times in the Houston Post, three times in Texas Monthly Magazine, and twice in Houston Metropolitan Magazine. Hecker is currently teaching a painting class at the University of Houston and working on her art full time. One of her recent projects is a new commission for a local business owner. We're at the restaurant 80 where Rachel is painting a mural on three walls. Rachel, how did you undertake this project? How did you get this project? Um, the owner of the restaurant, Shannon Wynn, decided to enlarge the space and after negotiations with their landlords, they got this space. It's going to have two extra booths in it. And I did the one of the murals that's in the main part of the restaurant called Tomorrow. And it, it was, um, although it was an image I wanted to paint, there were some concessions I made when I was painting it. Um, and Shannon said that his idea would be to let me do anything I wanted as long as it didn't have too much skin or food or booze. So that's how I came up with this, with, this with this job and this design. And how did you show them what the design would look like? I, well, uh, I had this kind of idea that I thought was sort of in some ways a one-line joke, but it was an image that I really wanted to make. And um, I, I felt that presentation was really important, so I, I built this little fancy maquette. Sorry about this. <laughs> Um, can you see this? Da, 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 it's my traveling art show. Um, it shows a space to scale um, with the booths kind of crudely depicted. I think they'll be round and soft. I've got them with lots of hard corners and stuff. And basically it was a joke about uh, Mason being the manufacturers of Dot's candy and putting Perry Mason in it. But for me it goes beyond that because I think um, when we look at this image, we would never think of Raymond Burr, we would think of Perry Mason, so it, it, it sort of speaks to artifice and ownership and issues of propriety and stuff like that, if you want to take it that far. But I think it's just a delightful little image. I think it'll look rather nice in this space. Lyrical, buoyant, colorful. And how was it received when you brought it in? Oh, he loved it, but Shannon's a kook, so <laughs> it was kind of an easy sell. <laughs> you know, he's, he's, he's really idiosyncratic, and I think he's... Um, He's, he's very playful and very very childlike in a lot of ways, so it was okay. And tell us about the process. How do you get started? How do you complete um, something like this? The, the starting part is, is actually designing the image and, and making things fit proportionately and, and have a good feeling to them, but then, of course, scaling it up this way um, from 6 inches to 12 or 14 feet, whatever these walls are. Um, I did a lot of diagrammatic drawings. I think I've got some of them here with like hundreds of really peculiar and probably inaccurate measurements on them. Um, so the whole thing is kind of 
conceived in terms of layout before I even get here. And theoretically, I, I should be able to come in and, and determine, for instance, that you know, from Wayne's coding to middle of letters is exactly 73 and a half inches, and hopefully when I lay everything out, everything else will fit, you know? <laughs> and I won't end up with just, uh, you know, just the word dots or just uh, the painting of Perry Mason, but everything will look as it's supposed to look here. And that's sort of the phase I'm in now. I'm just, I've specced out where the letters go. Um, everything will get a base coat of yellow except for these, which I'll go ahead and just paint with um, black and white. And um, the last thing I'll do is come in with the airbrush and do some of the dots and, and actually render the figure. And how long do you expect that the whole process to take? Um, I'd be disappointed if I was here for more than a week and a half. But I, I don't know what's fantasy and what's fiction. It's, it's very different than when you're working in the studio and you have a completely controlled environment and you sort of know your way. And I, I don't normally paint on sheetrock most places. Um, that you do commissions for a mural sport uh, because they're concerned about um, conservation and being able to preserve them well and take care of them. You usually either do them on canvas or a board and install them and they can be removed. But Shannon feels very strongly that they'd be on the wall and when they sell the building, he'll repaint them. He doesn't want anyone to own them and he doesn't want us to have this, the, the sense that he, he'll pay us a little bit of money and then end up reselling them at some point. I think jobs like this for me are not about the money um, because they don't pay well, but it's about being able to realize an image this scale in a context like this. It has a life for me that's more than a painting. For the past four years, Hecker has had a studio in the Heights where she took time out from her work to talk with us. Rachel, in addition to the mural at 8 what are some of the other projects you're working on right now? Well, at the moment, I'll be working at the 8 until it's finished, but one of the problems I'm having when I'm painting it is I'm thinking of, I've got two other mural commissions. One is a 48-foot-long um, painting that's going in the new Federal Reserve Bank in Dallas. And the other is a 20-foot-long painting that's going on in the post office in Galveston. I understand for the Houston International Festival will be a billboard of your artwork? Yeah, they, um, they've chosen, I think it's six um, artists from Houston and six from Mexico. And they're taking paintings and blowing them up to billboard size, which, you know, if you look at some of my work, it's already almost there. But yeah. So it'll be posted somewhere in Houston? I think that, uh, well, they're going to be outdoors, which is an interesting concept for painting. You know, I mean, we're not used to looking at painting that way. And I think they're going to be downtown in the festival. and. They have plans to show the paintings as a group in public spaces that are big enough to accommodate them, like airports and <laughs> I don't know where else, airport hangars, I'm sure, or something, you know, enormous cavernous spaces, because some of the paintings will be as big as 12 feet high by 24 feet long. Last year, you had a solo show at the Texas Gallery that was covered in the Chronicle and the Post and in the Houston Press. Mm -hmm. Tell us about some of the work in that show. Well, the work, there were, let me see, there were four, I think there were 10 foot tall paintings and um, a couple of smaller paintings, about six feet tall. And they all, in, in some ways, dealt with, with similar issues. They were all um, very much dealt with realism. They're pictures of people. But in each case, something was obscuring the features. Um, and, and my thought in, in making all of them, the thing that I think ties most of the paintings together is, um, uh, a thing that I had been thinking about after, you know, 12 years of, of Republicans being in off office, and that was the um, uh, a kind of complete denial of the self, um, issues of censorship, issues of loss of identity. I'd begun to think that um, any creative art or, uh, act seemed almost anarchistic, um, <clears throat> and so even though I'm depicting things in, in most cases like white middle class uh, power sort of images, all, all male except for one painting. Um, I, I think that, you know, e even, at, e even in corporate America, that, that that is a denial of the self. It's not just um, complicity. It's also, I, I see those people also as victims. Um, the only painting that was different was a painting of a woman whose arms were obscuring her own face. And there was a clock painted um, over her torso with the time, I think it was 12.59 p.m. Um, and I was thinking very much about the 11th hour of women's rights and how people were kind of using it as a buzzword during the election, saying we're in the 11th hour. And I thought, well, now we're, we're far beyond the 11th hour when, in fact, we're fighting for rights that we 
we got 20 years ago. Um, so it, it was more than, than a, a painting about a kind of caution. It was you know, sort of a scream of despair. You work a lot in black and white tones. Yeah, um, I stopped using color because I felt that, that the decisions I made in a painting had to be very deliberate and, and color seemed um, kind of superfluous. I also think that black and white images, um, from a lot of people refer to memory because it's, it's the way they remember things. Um, it's also the way a lot of people dream. And, and I thought that the paintings could in some way insinuate themselves better into each person's consciousness if they were in black and white. There's something nostalgic about a lot of the images I use. Um, um, and they're also very much about photography. You know, these, these paintings, I, I think a lot of artists use photography as a way to expedite a painting, to make an image happen faster. And one of the things that I was trying to do was to slow the process down. People, some people will look at my paintings and wonder how they're made, um, if in fact they're photographs. And um, although that doesn't like necessarily interest me, I think the good thing that happens is that they might end up being with the work for a few more minutes than they normally would. Uh, so I think it sort of slows down the whole process. Talk about the process of creating those particular paintings that were large scale on wood. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of um, the process, the, the actual process of the thinking of the paintings comes out of collage and drawing. And um, it, it really comes very much out of a spirit in, of play. I think that um, I, I've noticed that when I sort of give myself permissions in terms of combining images and sort of suspend everything I think about normally um, in terms of picture making, I'm able to, to, in the process of free associating, come up with something that's content full and might have even more of a capacity to resonate in a way um, than if I were absolutely deliberately thinking, well, I have to put this image with this image to make a painting about homophobia, for instance. Um, so the process is, is, is a little bit unconscious, although I think w when you're selecting things you're, things, you're making decision. If I have piles of images, um, I've already made some of the decisions. So it, it starts with that. Um, and they're, they're painted, they're acrylic paint on wood. Um, actually, they're on doors. And the only reason they're on, they're on you know, um, hollow core mahogany doors, they cost about nine or 12 bucks a piece. And I started painting that way because it was inexpensive. And because of the lines that happens in them, in this case, uh, vertical and, and most of them horizontal, uh, for me, they referred more to a kind of commercial image like a billboard. And I, I like that association. I think that interesting work for me happens when the images hover dangerously between fine and maybe applied art. You know, like they, they look like they could be out in the world next to a, a subway stop or a bus stop. Um, but you more than likely see them in a uh, gallery. One of the things about the scale, though, too, was to refer to that, what, what I consider a public kind of image. Um, most people can't buy these paintings, not because they're expensive, but because they're big. Like, they, I can't hang them in my house. They're, they're two inches too short, which sort of makes me sad because I like some of them. Um, and I normally don't put my own work up in my house. Um, but, but there's something about that non-ownership that they, that they can't be owned really that way. And if they could, it would probably be in corporate co collections. And then I, I sort of think of that as almost being subversive. I like that. I mean, in a lot of ways, there are attacks on corporate uh, society. And, and, and if a big corporation were to buy one of these, I'd feel great about it. Your work has been mentioned along with Renee Magritte and Andrew Warhol. What would you say about those kind of comparisons? comparisons. Well, um, I, I didn't understand the Magritte. Um, it, I, it was in reference to, I think, the painting Bowling Trophy. Um, and actually, that painting um, was, that was really one of the only paintings that I've done that was specifically, uh, specifically had art historical references. It was, it was made with a great amount of love uh, for an artist named John Baldessari who was influential as a teacher and has always been really uh, highly regarded by artists. And he's in his 60s, and he's only, you know, in the past 10 years gotten the kind of recognition he deserves. And he sort of invented the device of taking a, a ball, a flat disc, and painting it over a person's face. And um, if you look to the art magazines, that, that particular gesture has been appropriated by, you know, just hundreds of, of artists. And you see it in art schools. 
But what I did was make the thing real, make the circle real, so it turned it into a ball, and it was uh, just supposed to be an ironical um, appropriation of that de device, and, and certainly a tip of the hat to, to John Baldessari. So I, I didn't get the Magritte thing at all. Um, I, th I thought that was misguided, actually. Um, and as for Warhol, he's, he's one of my heroes, um, and, and I think probably I come out of a pop tradition more than anything. Um, I, when I was in school in Philadelphia, I lined up w when Warhol was signing his books, or, or I, at least I think it was Warhol, I don't think it was a double, and it was around Valentine's Day, and I, I had just a bit, little bit of money left, and I stopped and uh, bought a big box of Valentine's for him. And I had a 35 millimeter camera in my bag and there were these long lines to get to see him signing his book. And I couldn't afford the book, but I, I got in line and I went up to the table. And as I leaned over to give him the Valentines, my camera smashed out of my bag on the table and he just jumped up and flew out. And I think he thought I was shooting him. You know, like it was, he was sort of like reliving his own nightmare all over again. I thought, shit, well, this is, I've blown it. You know, this is my hero, and he thinks I'm trying to shoot him or something. <laughs> Ruined everything. He didn't. He didn't appreciate the Valentine, and I can understand it. But I, I like that association. That's fair, I think. You worked at the Glassell School of Art for almost nine years mm -hmm. as both a teacher and mm -hmm. an administrator. Mm -hmm. What What did you get from that experience? You know, I got that job um, when I was in graduate school at Rhode Island School of Design. The, the man who um, was, a, was hired as director of Glassell School, Alan Hacklin, um, was uh, the guy who I would, I was his teaching assistant at RISD, at Rhode Island School of Design, and he kind of on a lark, you know, responded to an ad in the New York Times, and to make a long story short, ended up with this job, and came down to Houston and assessed the staff and the situation, and figured he needed a little bit of office help and someone to teach, in addition to the teaching staff that was here, and he said, look, it's an eight-month job, you work four days a week, you can go home if you hate it, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, it was an eight month job that lasted eight and a half years. Um, but I, I, it was important to me. I mean, I think in, in lots of ways I, I grew up as a person in that job. Um, not because of it, but you know, <laughs> just sort of happened um, because of chronology. And, and we did interesting things at the school. We started the, the core program, um, which is really the only, uh, program of its kind f for young artists, and I think it has easily some of the most interesting young artists graduating from um, all of the art schools around the country, um, and and actually some schools in Europe. Um, each what does year. that involve the core program? Well, originally we started with 20, I think it was 22 or 23 people. We called up art schools and teachers. We knew, we said, look, we've got this space in Houston. We're willing to give these kids a stipend. It's modest. We're going to have a really great visiting artist program. We'll give them studio space. Um, we'll give them a little bit of money, you know, and all they have to do is do their work. It's not like school. There's no rules, you know, uh, other than basic conduct things. Um, and. Uh, We'll support them. I mean, we want them to make their work. That's what we want them to do here. And, and they would come for one year with the option of reapplying for a second, which almost everyone did, um, at least when I was affiliated with the program. I'm sure they still do. Um, and the first year was, you know, I mean, it, it was just incredible. We had, we had some of the most interesting artists um, from around the country who were working come down to Houston because there was still curiosity about the place and, and because I think we just had the guts to call them up and say, would you come down to Houston and talk to these kids? We don't pay very much, but we'll take you out for dinner and they sure want to meet you. You know, it was a real aw shucks kind of pitch and it worked every time. Um, and, uh, you know, the core programs evidenced its, its importance in, in Houston by the number of, of, of artists who have continued to stay here and contribute. Um, and uh, be a viable and vital part of the art community and be in, you know, some of the best collections in the museum collection, um, et cetera. So I, I think it's really been a great program for Houston and certainly uh, kept my interest up over the eight years that I was at the school, though the other programs did as well. But it was, um, you know, I, I did go from this sort of part-time eight-month thing to being at one point acting director of the school and 
if you're a practicing professional artist and you have a full-time job, uh, even if you're only supposed to be in four days a week, it doesn't work. You know, it's, and I felt like um, if I really wanted to take myself seriously, I, I had to give this more time. I had to be in the studio more. And um, you know, it was scary at first, and people think you're absolutely nuts. I always like to say that my friends like my job more than I did. They like my big office and, you know, whatever. Um, but um, I'm really glad I did it. I think my work changed radically. I think when you, when you have to spend an enormous amount of time doing things that you don't necessarily want to do, um, the time you spend in the studio or, or whatever it is that you want to be doing, t you know, I, I was so concerned about production and, and not that I had to be churning things out, but that I just couldn't waste time. And, and I think um, when you do that, you, the, the opportunity for play um, almost just disappears, and I, I think most good work comes out of that. So I'm glad to have the time now. I understand you organized the first art auction in Houston? Well, it was, yeah, but when we, when we got to Glossel School, there were programs that we were starting that we didn't have funding for, so we had to establish new funding, and also um, there was a mandate from the museum that the, muse that the school should start to become more autonomous. Um, which was something that we, we very much wanted, but, but there hadn't been enormous precedent for. Um, and, and so we thought that it might be an interesting uh, um, idea. Well, Al, Alan Hack and I really wanted um, very much to see all of the work that was being made here. And even in the largest group shows, you don't get to see sort of everyone's work. And we knew we were having this big benefit fundraiser, and we thought we don't want to have another fundraiser. Um, we're just the board of trustees kind of come to and the artists are totally eclipsed in the process. So we sort of concocted the idea of the auction as a way of um, having an enormous group show. Um, and by doing that, by asking artists to donate work, by um, also giving them tickets to come so they would be at the party. And we were trying to, to foster a different kind of spirit. Um, uh, also, I think one of the things we did that was unusual was we offered the artists the uh, chance to re retain 60% of their market value, and we started bidding at 50% of market value. Or is it the other way around? I might, I might have my percentages off, but we protected their market value, and we gave them something back, and we invited them to the party. Um, and it was the first time that that happened. And, and now I, th I think all you have to do is sort of read your mail and see a pr proliferation of, of art auctions. I think that the sad thing is now that artists tend to be overextended, I get hit up for something all the time. And usually I give, give it. You had your first solo show in Houston in 1988 at the Texas Gallery. Yeah. Talk about the work in that particular show. Woo. Woo. That was scary. Um, I think that the, the work in that show uh, was really, in, it, it's interesting to me, for, for me to think about in retrospect. They're all paintings on canvases, and they were paintings either of, of people or still life setups. The people were appropriated images from movie magazines, and the still life setups were things that I took pictures of, um, mostly objects that were around me, that, you know, cigarettes and coffee cups and dirty ashtrays and stuff like that. They were painted, I think they're about 60 by 80 inches, so they weren't small and they weren't big. Um, but what I was trying to do was um, I kind of convinced myself that maybe I should just try to be a painter, and maybe I should just try to make paintings that were about painting. and. Um, I wasn't trained as a painter. I, 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 I never had a painting class per se, only uh, in, in commercial art. And my background was in sculpture. When I went to RISD, I was accepted into um, the painting department because they just didn't know where to put me. You know, the work wasn't flat. It wasn't really three-dimensional. And um, they tended to be more permissive in painting. So I, I found myself there, but I never made paintings in the painting department. And I was working on these drawings that were, were, were very realistic. Um, that they were mostly of people, but, but I sort of felt like they were, they were misunderstood. In other words, I, it, in my mind, they were very contentful. But when people bought them, they bought them um, because they looked like someone or they were someone. And I think they were buying them the same way they might buy a piece of nostalgia or movie poster. Um, so I thought that if I could suspend content and just concentrate on um, drawing or possibly painting because the drawings were getting really kind of elaborate and I sort of felt like they should be paintings, um, th then I would do, you know, that 
that, that I would try to I would try to figure out how to do that, and I, I did have to invent painting for myself. I knew I wanted my hand to be out of the paintings, um, um, and and the only thing I could think of was commercial applications like billboard painting, and that led me to airbrush. Um, but also, when I was at RISD in, in um, 1980, 82, the, my teachers were Eric Fischel and David Sally and Tom Lawson and kind of like all the big guys that you think of when you think of the 1980s in, in the art world. And um, they talked about things that, that were so foreign to me. They talked about um, notions of patricide and fratricide and like an art you had to kill your, it wasn't enough to kill your father, you had to kill your brothers and that's why David Sally had this, you know, enormous competition with Julian Schnabel and, you know, they're always like talking about each other and it was, it, the, their motivation seemed so different than the, the reasons that I chose to be in a studio or chose to make art. Um, and and I, I think it was very much male dominated and I reacted against that, and that's another reason why I had no intention of ever making a painting, and and certainly not ever making a painting that was just about you know the issues in painting um, or in art. But in that show, I found myself doing that, and um, I, I think it generated in some ways from things that Eric Fischel said. I, I, I think you know I think that David Sally's a kind of I never think of him as a painter, I think of him as a good artist. And I, I, I think of Eric Fischel as someone who's very much trying to be a, a, a good painter. Um, and what I found after that show and in the next few years when I continued just to paint was that it wasn't satisfying. Um, so, you know, there were things in that show that I, I, I think kind of indicated um, steps that, that might happen in future work, but, but what I really did after that and after deciding that I couldn't sustain myself as, as a painter. And, and also, I remember um, one of my heroes, all-time heroes, Barbara Kruger, was in town. And um, we were kind of going around and doing stuff. And she wanted to see the galleries. And I didn't want to show her my show, because that's like, you know, hanging out your dirty underwear. And, I mean, I really think this woman is like really, really great. And. Um, she, you know, really wanted to see the show, so we went over and she's kind of going through and I introduced her to Frederick and stuff and she's going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Really well made, Rachel. And I thought, yeah, that they're really well made. They're, you're right, they're really well made. She didn't say anything bad, but you know, that was it. That's what they were. And um, I thought that was a really great lesson. Uh, but, but I'd probably learned it by the time I'd made them. Um, so I sort of t took a hiatus uh, from painting for a while and realized that if I, if I went back to it or whatever kind of work I had to make, it would have to be more purposeful, that I wasn't, I wasn't interested in um, kind of formalist language. Or I was, uh, but I didn't want that to sort of be the end. And um, I, I think I started to make these peculiar little drawings in my studio. Um, I did a lot of writing. I thought about, you know, filmmaking. I thought about things that I never did before and kind of just took a hiatus. But these little drawings started to happen. And um, they're basically like ripped off images from Warner Brothers cartoons and Disney and stuff. And then I would do things to them, like kind of mean things would happen or bad things would happen to them. I would look at these things every night. I'd come home like compulsively from work and start making them. And they're real labor intensive and fastidious and stuff. And, and I would look at it at the end and I'd go, what is this? You know, what is this thing? It doesn't look like a drawing. I don't, this isn't a drawing. It's not a, what is it? And I thought if anyone, I, saw, I thought if my, if my dealer saw this, they would just, they would say, oh, poor Rachel. You know, <laughs> something really sad has happened to her and, you know, forget it. And so I didn't, you know, I just sort of like kept them all in a box. And then Frederica called me one day. She's like, well, we're going to have a drawing show. And you have any new work? And I thought, oh, man, you know, I haven't done anything in like two years, right? New work. I got these box of weird things. So I thought, okay, mm -hmm. I'll show them to her. So I went in. I'm like, you know, like really apologetic. I'm like really ready to get down on my knees and say, I know I made a real mistake this time, Frederica. It'll never happen again. But you know, just don't say anything to me. And I give her, give her these drawings, and she loved them. She she was like she was like wild for them. She you know hadn't seen these things before, and and she thought they were really great fun, and um, which completely shocked me. I mean, I didn't show them to anyone until that point, and then they, she put them in this drawing show at Texas Gallery, and. Um, and people liked them, and I really liked them. I, I still don't know exactly what they are, except for I think that um, one of the things that's continued to interest me since then is like when I take an image like this, which is directly out of a, 
a coloring book. I, I do it for several reasons. I do it because this image with these words should never be in a coloring book. I think it's mean. You know, it's just horrible. It's mean and vicious, and kids shouldn't shouldn't be seeing this, and they shouldn't think that it's 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 a funny thing to sort of laugh at at, at homelessness and. Um, people who have less than them, but I also think about, uh, I kind of grew up on these images. I think we all did. And, you know, Disney has that great commercial now, Friends You Can Believe In. I, I think that they do everything that they can and put an enormous amount of money into uh, making these characters, like Bugs Bunny and, and whoever, as real as possible for kids. And if, if they've insinuated that themselves that much in my consciousness, then, then I sort of feel like I own them. And I guess I'm sort of testing that every time I, I take them and use them verbatim. Um, but but I, I never pretend to author them. I just reuse them. And I, I think of the drawings that I make very much like a, like a collage. I, th I think of this painting very much as a collage. Um, and I guess that show, that being in that little drawing show and kind of realizing that I could do something that I thought was just totally off base, um, kind of gave me confidence and led to paintings that were like that drawing, um, this painting and others, and, and then back to a kind of realism combined with uh, cartoon images. I'm, I'm still making those drawings, they just happen. I think it's now a sort of extension of writing. You have one particular drawing, I think you titled it, I Was a Dead Man's Horse? Yes. Can you talk about that one a little bit? It looks like uh, coloring out the side of the lines. Yeah. Um, th yeah, there's actually, there's several of them. And, and that image um, of the little sheriff, I think he was being held up at a bank. I think that was the deal. He's got like a stack of money and his arms are raised. And he's, he's kind of, or he's a bank teller. He's kind of got like a little checkered vest. But you know, I, I would buy these comic books and these coloring books at, at like Thrift Village. And so they were used, you know, and that's the way the image was. This kid with the red pen who, you know, will probably be making a lot of money and show at Mary Boone Gallery someday, just went with this all over the image. And then I made collage on top of it and kind of um, took it verbatim from that. But, but I, you know, I just thought it was just this kind of beautiful and violent gesture in, in that coloring um, in and outside of the lines. And I, I just thought, uh, Graphically, it was something that worked very well. That was one of the first paintings like that, and I, th I think that's on canvas, which was something I, s I stopped using, but I'm kind of relaxing, and I might start painting on canvas again. I don't know. Painting on canvas always seems like painting with a capital P. You know, painting on this stuff seems like painting on wood. It's, it's different. It has a different kind of life to it. Doesn't, it doesn't mean quite so much. You know, it's non-traditional? Yeah, I think so. Oh, I just think it's sort of like what people think about painting, you know. And, and I loved it. When the museum bought two of my paintings, but when the first one they bought, it was a painting on gator foam, which is a really durable, resistant surface. It's plastic. It's like, and the paints I use are acrylic. That's plastic, and it's a completely, uh, you know, kind of homogenous entity and very durable. I mean, you put the stuff outside, but anyways, the condition report when they when they accepted the painting. They, they wrote in the condition report that it was fragile. And that really pissed me off, because I'm like, well, there's nothing fragile about it, but I guess because it wasn't properly stretched on canvas. But then the great thing is they were framing it, and their framer slipped, and they popped a nail right through it. And I said, well, that thing wasn't fragile when it was in my studio. I was kicking it around. It was fine. It's only till one of y'all just sort of missed with the nail gun and sent a nail through it. They, they fixed it up. There's a particular image that you use in your work. There's four of these figures in a 1991 piece called Plain View. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about what that image means for you? Right, that, um, that painting, it's, I think it's an eight foot square painting that's painted you know, on, on this uh, mahogany veneer plywood. Um, what that painting actually depicts is, is cell division. It's actually a progression of, of, a, of a cell dividing and becoming more than one cell. Um, and what I was thinking about was r really a kind of disease. I was thinking, I, I, at first I thought I was thinking about AIDS, and then I kind of realized I was thinking about cancer. Um, and, and that painting is, is specifically about that. It's just sort of like when you look at it, and some people, I think, I think people have taken biology and still remember it, can identify that as a cell um, dividing. And then there's, I've superimposed a light emitting diode clock that gives a sense of time, which is fractions of a second, you know, between each sort of stage of division. 
Um, and my idea was that you've got all these sort of cells in your body and you don't really know what's happening with them. I mean, there's, there's good ones and there are bad ones and, and <clears throat> it might be very hard to tell the difference between the two. Um, but my father died of cancer uh, 17 years ago in, in Rhode Island and it was really, it was really strange because um, within like a two year period, I think it was like 75% of, of the houses had a person die of cancer. And at that time, Rhode Island had the highest per capita cancer rate in the country. And, and I just remember all these kind of traumas um, associated, for, first with losing your father, but then with things like the death certificate never said cancer, and I wondered why it said he died of a heart attack. Well, yeah, he did, but it was because there was nothing left of him kind of thing. Um, and, and it, it was stigmatized. I think cancer then was stigmatized in, in some ways um, the way AIDS is now, although, you know, obviously not to the same degree. Um, but it's just something that I, I don't think I've reconciled in my own mind and that I still have enormous fears about. Um, and, and I, uh, you know, I found it appropriate for whatever reasons to make a painting about that. Another one of my lyrical and buoyant periods. Let's make a painting about cancer. Really great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. In 1990, you did a painting called Light, which was a picture of Hedy Lamar with the words light over her face. Right. Spelled L-I-T-E. You want to know about that painting? Yeah. Um, that was for a show in Austin at w Women and Their Work called Women View Women. And I think what they did was ask 10 um, more established women artists to pick 10, you know, each pick a younger artist, and, and I was asked um, to be in that show. And they, they wanted us to either make work specifically that dealt with being a woman and depicting women because it's a huge problem. I mean, um, you know, if, if, if you assume that the traditional audience for looking at art has always been male, um, then kind of how do you paint a woman? How do you do that? Um, so I, I kind of wanted to, to talk about the social aspects of, of depiction and um, I thought of the word light, L-I-T-E, as a, a sort of catchphrase for all these diet products and, you know, everything's light now. And um, how women are used as sort of vehicles uh, to, to sell things and, and, and to me that translates as, as having very much to do with the commodification of women. Um, and there was another pun in there because I, I chose Hedy Lamar not only because she's beautiful and I think she epitomizes that kind of um, stereotypical beauty that, that women are supposed to aspire um, towards, uh, but, but also because she was busted for shoplifting so many times, you know, and this kind of really tragic little uh, twist. Um, in the story, I, I can't remember how many department stores they sort of stopped her at the door and, and said, Miss Lamar, what's in your purse? And it was filled with like Max Factor and you know, all this junk that I think she could have afforded, but she just liked liberating the thing. So um, <laughs> uh, the, the pun didn't have that much to do with it, but, but for me, it, it, making that painting, which, which I'm still not satisfied with, um, I, I, I thought that it was important when, when I was working with images and, and ideas like that, that the, that the work very much had to kind of speak in the language of the person or thing it was trying to attack or point a finger at. Um, and I think it works on that level. I mean, I think that the, the images are very slick. Um, the words are put on carefully. Um, they're, they're made well. They're made like a kind of product. They have that feeling to them. but. I also think that they're, they're very didactic and in, in, in some ways kind of pedantic. And I think that that's a problem women have uh, more than men. And I think it, it has to do with, you know, just that whole thing of us feeling like if, if we're going to compete on any level, and I, I mean this even in terms of just kind of pure thought and thinking, um, that we have to do it better. We have to be more honest. We have to be more rigorous in terms of, of how we design something, even if it's a, a sentence or a thought. Um, and I felt very much a, r a responsibility when I was making that painting to, to do those things. Um, and I, I, I think I was burdened by it, and I think that the painting is burdened because of it. There were, there were two other paintings that I can think of that happened at different periods. One was in that sort of, you know, kind of pure painting uh, mode for my 88 show at Texas Gallery. It was a painting called uh, Menthol. It was a picture of a woman um, painted in what I call menthol green color. Um, that also dealt with the commodification of women. 
Um, it used a, an image of a woman from a, a soft porn magazine from the 50s, although there, there's, yeah, I don't think there's any indication of that. It's just a headshot. Um, but she does have that blissful kind of, you know, rocking head, you know, sort of or, orgasmic look on her face and, and all that hair and lipstick and stuff. And, um, and so there was that one. And then there was a painting I did for the out show, which uh, was a painting of a, a nude woman walking away uh, from the viewer it's with the words superimposed, don't lay your morality on me, which are lyrics from a Frank song. And, and I think in, in all three instances, like, I just didn't hit right, you know, it just it didn't make it right. But I think that the painting that, that dealt with women most successfully was the one in the last show called Eleventh Hour. Um, and I think it, it probably has to do with um, not feeling like you have to beat someone up with information, assuming that they can get it, maybe if, if you use metaphor or innuendo. And I think art, for me, always has had more power when it, when it does that. Um, and it's just um, something that I, you know, I have to be careful of. I think I also, this is a really rotten thing to say, but I, I think I also think of women more as individuals than I think of men. I mean, men to me are kind of like another species. And I, you know, I, I'm, I'm very guilty of kind of deciding that they have certain attributes and they're all like this. You know, they're all like this. They all should have on white shirts and they all have a certain kind of hair and they all look a certain way. And I, pa I can paint them really easily because they're all the same guy, you know? But I can't paint a chick. That's really a hard thing for me to do. That's when I get really screwed up um, because I, I can't make them generic. I can't, I can't do that. I, I just can't. I can't, sorry, you know? <laughs> I don't want to either, but, but I can't. Um, and it's, it's something that I think about a lot. I, I want to paint paintings about women. Maybe the experience is just cl too close to mine to sort of examine. I think, I think the things I paint best, I'm able to sort of uh, keep at arm's length. You know, I, I can sort of examine it. It's at a safe distance, and it's um, usually something that I'm critical of. You have a 1987 painting called Forefather's Dream, which is mm -hmm. a boy. Was that one of your first paintings? That was one of the first paintings. But and what I was thinking about was stereotypes, and, and stereotypes particularly from the times I grew up. Um, I found these images from science and health manuals that were, were sort of, the dates coincided with when I was in elementary school and might have had a book like that, and it looked very much like the things I had when I was in school. And typically it would show the boy, you know, kind of in class studying and the girl sleeping, or the boy running and doing something, the girl brushing her teeth or brushing her hair. You know, and it just, it was just su such classic, you know, kind of manual for how to be submissive. Um, you know, and I, I kind of started with that stuff and, and we all did when we were this big. And, and so those paintings, that was one of them. There was also a, a painting of a girl that, that went with it. They were kind of companion pieces um, that I always imagined uh, t together um, because I, th I think you have to sort of look at the comparison. And it, it, those paintings were, to me, about stereotypes. I don't know if that's um, evidenced. I think that they're intentionally nostalgic looking because, again, they're meant to remind you of, of you know, kind of your history and, and that maybe these are things that you grew up with too. So you first came to Houston in 1982. What was your impression of the city and the art community at that time? Mm. Well, I moved here in August 15th, 1982, so you have to understand, I mean, I, I didn't breathe for two weeks. and. Um, it, it was real curious because no one was no one was really nice to me at my job, you know. I mean, my boss was, but I think everyone else speculated that I was here because I was sleeping with him, um, and and so they, they, you know, they didn't really like me. And I guess there were other people in Houston who would have liked to be teaching at Glassell at the time, and who was I? And uh, my second night in town, um, we went to the Eleventh Street Cafe, and we were invited into an artist whose whose name will go unmentioned, a, a well-known, older-established artist. We were invited to, to the 11th Street Cafe, which I don't even think it was called that back then, but there was kind of bands at night, and it looked the same. People would drink beer and listen to these bands and do the two-step, which I didn't know what that was. And we went and did that, and no one talked to me, and I thought, well, this is really great. I mean, these are going to be my friends, and why won't they talk to me? And, and then after, you know, we had a couple of beers and watched people dance, we were invited to this artist's studio, and he said, you know, like artists do with it, say, what do you think of these paintings? And, you know, I, I told him what I thought, and that was the wrong answer, you know. 
whatever I said, I shouldn't have said, and, and it, it, it all, I mean, it ended up with Alan sort of standing there and his juggler vein was like throbbing and they were face to face and this, this, this big painter was standing over him and they were screaming at each other and the guy was telling him to put me on a plane and send me back to Rhode Island where I belong because obviously I didn't know jack shit about, you know, I didn't, blah, 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 it's just on and on and on. And so that was like my introduction to Houston. I thought, no one's going to talk to me. They, some of them aggressively hate me. They're probably going to start a campaign to like buy me an air, air ticket back. And, and I didn't do anything, you know? I just, I just kind of landed here and I didn't do anything. So it was slow. What are your impressions of the art community now? Oh, it's changed a whole lot. Um, I, I think in a lot of ways, and, and the core program is one of the things that had a large uh, part to do with it is that it, my sense was in 1982 that it was very much a, a kind of big fish little pond syndrome, that there were a few people here, um, 99 and 9 tenths percent of the male who sort of got a little bit of attention and got a little bit of focus, and then there wasn't anyone else. There was like no middle ground. Um, and now it's very different. You know, now those people are still here, but there's also 350 young artists uh, making work and, and contributing in a really vital way. So I, I think that the ponds got a little bigger and the big fish got a little smaller and, and there's a lot more minnows, you know? So it's changed. And the, as, as, as far as, you know, institutionally, the, the Menil collection, I think, has certainly um, just changed, this, changed the way people perceive this entire part of the country. Houston is, is as complicated an art center as, as New York or, or LA, um, I think as sophisticated and has as much work, as much of a range of work going on, just doesn't have as, as many artists. So I think it's a really great place to be living and working. Tell us about some of your experiences in graduate school. First of all, I went to the only all women's art school in the country. It's called Moore College of Art in Pennsylvania. I had a uh, single-sexed um, high school education, so I'd uh, kind of been educated with women, and I go off to this college for women, and it's like there's hardly any women teachers, you know, and this is, <laughs> I'm kind of wondering, I'm getting a little bit older and a little little smarter, and I'm kind of wondering, like, why things are like this, and it was just sort of premonition, it was just sort of telling me how the art world was going to be, um, but but one of the things that, it, that, that it's, it has really, really influenced me um, is you know now how vitally important I think it is for for people like me and other young-ish, <laughs> if I can still say that, women to be teaching, you know, to be in schools, to 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 be mentors, to be role models. I didn't know what a woman artist looked like, you know. I didn't know how they dressed. I knew they weren't making paintings. I knew they weren't in any of my art history books. I knew they weren't being written about, you know. And and when teachers, I was always you know kind of precocious in school and did well. And they would try to trick me up. And I remember one guy saying, "So Rachel, what are you reading now?" And it was like 1977 or 76, and I said, well, I'm reading From the Center. Have you ever re read it, you know? And it was a collection of, of feminist writings about art that was uh, compiled by Lucy Lepard, I think, yeah. You know, it was a really important book for me, but it was not part of any of these men's experience, and here I am at an all-women's art school. Uh, you earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in sculpture. What was your sculpture like? It was it was it was non-traditional, and and the reason why I ended up in that department at all was because they allowed me to, to, to sort of have a kind of license. But the sculptures were um, they were they were things that belonged in rooms. They were either benches or rugs or or bits of furniture, things that looked like furniture or things that actually did function. But for instance, um, if if you remember that old linoleum that would be imprinted with um, something that to to look like carpet, linoleum that was meant to look like carpet, well, I would take that and mount it on like three quarter inch plywood and then trim the edges really beautiful and put it on the floor. So it was like this fake throw rug, you know? Mm -hmm. And people kind of look at them and go, ooh. I, I think I was very much influenced at that point by uh, the sculptor Richard Archwagger, um, who, who I still think is, is really pretty brilliant. Um, you know, there was stuff like that. There were benches that looked like slabs of marble and when you went up, they were either formica or marble or something like that. Very, very clean very sort of dense objects that just sort of sat there. You were born and raised in Providence, Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. What kind of clues did you have that you were going to be an artist? <laughs> um, I had a lot of clues. It was the only thing that I could do and do well. And, and um, one of the things that my parents 
didn't give me, and I, here I'll get all my revenge on them 34 years later. So they, they didn't let us have, like have toys, you know? And so we played with, I like to tell my mother I had to play with dirt, you know, things like every kid got to play with dirt and um, nails and stuff, like hammers and stuff like that. And my father, when he was feeling really generous, would give me his shirt cardboard, you know, from the back of shirts to draw on. And we were lavished as children, you see. And so I started drawing from when I was this big. There was nothing else to do. And um, I did it well. You know, I, I did it really well from the time I was little. I was real meticulous and, and could do all these kind of um, really intricate things. And I, I, I look at the little drawings now. My mother um, had, had the sense to save them, although she threw out all my report cards. You know, I, I try to piece t together my personal history and can't, can't really do it without these artifacts. Um, but yeah, I, I, it was just something that I that I did. I did compulsively from the, from the time I, I you know can remember, and um, was really miserable in school until I could focus my time and attention on it. I'll also say that in, in the in the summers we would go to Provincetown. That might have been a <laughs> a beacon, a beacon of light for little Rachel, frolicking in the dunes. Do you have specific goals or directions for the future? Hmm. Yeah. Um, I guess I'd like to get to a point where I'm not so much like trying to figure out if I can pay my mortgage in six months. So my, my goals are probably something that, you know, really a 22-year-old should be thinking on. I've had this stunted development, but I've gone from being very responsible to, to being kind of irresponsible and, and now I would just, I mean my goals really have, have more to do with doing whatever I have to do to give me the time to, to be in the studio and to make work. Um, and, and less to do with like I want to be at a certain place or I want to, I don't, I don't, there's no place I really want to move to. I mean, um, I think I like LA better than New York. I'm, I'm used to the warm weather. But Houston's okay, you know. Um, I, I'd like to be more comfortable somehow, but I'm not sure what that means. Um, and then I sometimes think maybe I thrive on worrying or the anxiety of not knowing exactly how I'm going to take care of all my business. But um, I just I just want to be happy. I, I want um, Nicola to graduate from school and become a lawyer and support me. That's that's what I want. That's simple. <laughs> hadn't, hadn't thought of that. <laughs> that is what I want. I'll be a housewife. I would love that. I like to cook. I like to play with my animals, and I like to paint. That sounds very Victorian, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So much for progress. <laughs> Give me the apron. <laughs> Thirteen days after beginning her new mural at 8.0, Hecker had it finished. On Wednesday, March 24th, the restaurant held an unveiling party attended by, among others, Walter Hopps, curator of the Menil Collection. I love Rachel's artwork, and I love the new Dot Bureau and the young Perry Mason. And uh, Perry Mason is gay and one of the really outstanding men in, who's been gay his whole life there in Hollywood and survived all that. And I think it's perfect that Rachel is doing him for this mural. Kind of goes along with a lot of the statements she makes in her work or in her life, I oh, imagine. Rachel is one of the leading lesbian artists in the whole country, and she's very strong and wonderful, and I like her subject. We're with Allison Green, curator of the Museum of Fine Arts. Tell us what Rachel Hecker has contributed to the arts community in Houston. Well, when I first came here in 1984, she was working at the museum school as an administrator, and I was immediately really impressed by how she was so generous to other artists here and she told me a lot about what was going on, who to keep an eye on and was one of the people who was really helpful in getting me grounded here and over time I realized that one of the reasons the art community is healthy in Houston is because she does so much herself not just um, as an administrator but what comes out of her studio and then a couple years ago she left the school and began devoting herself full time to studio work. And I've just been amazed by the burst of talent I've seen right. come out of her studio. Now you've curated a couple of shows at the museum that included pieces of her art. Tell us what you think about her artwork. 
Well, um, the shows I curated were both times shows that featured works in our collection. One was a show that surveyed Texas art, and we featured in it a still life painting that Rachel had done in around 1987. And it was airbrush still life, very monochromatic, I think really playing on expectations between what is painting, what is photography. And that was a show called Direction and Diversity that was up in the museum in 1988. And then last year, we did another show on pop art and its influences. And we showed another painting of Rachel's in that show that the museum also owns um, called Science Projects, where she used one of the Heckel and Jekyll birds for this wonderful um, image of this bird on a wire with an altimeter on its head, um, sort of indicating I think, you know, nervousness before taking off on flight. And that was just about the time that she herself took off from some of her administrative duties and became a full-time painter. And I think now, for example, with the two murals she's done at this restaurant, 8-0, uh, you can see how she can really work on a large scale. I've been involved with commissions that she's done at the University of Houston. And she's taken on other projects now, I think in Galveston and Dallas, which really give her an enormous scope for, you know, trying to take art out of the studio and into common places where you wouldn't expect to find art. For example, um, at the University of Houston, she did a mural at the con um, Computer Center. And that's a place where Usually people just sort of come and go very quickly doing administrative work at the, muse um, at the university. And there she did a fabulous multi-panel piece. Um, here at Edo, I think you probably have film of the marvelous pun she did with the Mason dots with Perry Mason in the center. And I think she has a marvelous ability to catch on what we recognize from our popular culture but to transform it and make it into something marvelous and strange. We're with Nicola Thompson, Rachel Hecker's girlfriend. Tell us what kind of person Rachel is. I call Rachel Mother Teresa, and it's because she's the most giving, generous, hardworking, community-minded person I've ever met. I mean, I've really tried to fashion my life after hers because she, she really believes in giving back to the community. You know, she feels like she's had good educational opportunities and whatnot. And, she volunteers at the Houston Area Women's Center every Monday morning. If you have a crisis, call in. Rachel will counsel you. <laughs> and she finds that very rewarding, I think, but also troublesome at times. Um, she also goes in when she's sick, which I find amazing because I would call in sick. But she feels very duty-bound. Sometimes I think she's donating too much of her artwork and, and her effort to the art charities around town, like, you know, Lawndale and Diverse Works and all that. Should I name names? You know, she really knocks herself out for these people and she always, you know, tries to make sure she can give them what they want in terms of donations and all. It's admirable. I noticed she did the artwork for Diverse Works 10th anniversary invitation. Yeah, she had to do four paintings for that. And uh, those are actually paintings to me. They look like photographs. My favorite is the Hedy Lamar one because everybody thought that was me, and it's not me, it's Hedy Lamar. The Dots one, I think, sort of gave her her idea, or maybe not, maybe that's not true, maybe I'm misrepresenting, but I think it gave her the idea for the Edo mural. What I don't did they do with these paintings? Um, they auctioned those off. And what Rachel said was they're not real painting quality because they're not on canvas, but still, they made some bucks anyway.
wraps up another edition of FemTV. We thank Rachel Hecker for her contributions to the art community and to the women's community in Houston.